Hi, Catamounts. My name is Josh Rochette. I am opinion editor at the Vermont Cynic, UVM's finest student publication. Uh, I'm Joey Brown. I'm also a, well, I'm an opinion writer at the, at the Cynic, which is a lot better than the Water Tower. And today I think we're going to be talking about uh, unions and their applicability today. The strike was ultimately a positive. Um, the way I see it, workers were dissatisfied with their conditions and they took peaceful legal recourse um, to mitigate it. What I thought was more interesting was sort of the student response to the entire thing. You always, whenever somebody goes on strike around UVM, like Sodexo or, or, the, or the bus workers, you always hear things like, we're in solidarity with or we stand with the bus workers or Sodexo or whomever. And you get the feeling that no matter what wages they were asking for, it could be $80 an hour, they'd be, they'd be saying they were in solidarity with them. I think it plays into a much larger aesthetic we have on the campus, though. Um, y you know, it's... I do love the school and I love the student body, but at the same time I think it's very easy to pay lip service to radicalism and not really think about what the implications of that are. If there were students saying, I'm in support of the CTTA strike and I'm going to think about how these working conditions play into you know larger social dynamics that I'm responsible for, then I think that would be one thing, even if the students were saying we stand in solidarity with $80 an hour. So I don't think it's so much the ends in and of themselves that are problematic, I think it's how easily and how superficially students tend to tap into that. Uh, the climate of, a, of, of an American college campus. I mean, there's always been this sort of, sort of gauzy nostalgia for the days when people went out and protested during the Vietnam era or, 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 or during Watergate or something or other. And so, you know, every so often people around UVM sort of get around some sort of cause that I feel and maybe I'm wrong, that they know not really much about, whether it's sort of GMOs or bus workers or Sodexo, they don't tend to be informed, but intrinsically they pick the side of, 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 of whom they perceive to be sort of the little man. I think it's very easy for people, frankly, from financially comfortable backgrounds who have benefited off exploitative systems to say, though it might be a genuine sense of empathy, it's really, it's much easier to you know, slap a I stand with Sodexo workers bumper sticker on your really, really nice car than it is to say, let's dismantle the social structure that gave me this really nice car. It sort of unfairly paints the side of, uh, of the left as being that which is always on the right side of history, as they say. I think it becomes much more problematic when you have people who have benefited off systems of oppression using that narrative to justify their hegemonic weight. And I think that that's kind of what makes a lot of the student movements on this campus feel so gross. Well, it was first the left that co-opted the idea of, of incorporating morality, especially that that comes from the Bible. People like Father Coughlin and Woodrow Wilson, who are considered... Uh, Wasn't he an anti-Semite, though, Father Coughlin? Father Coughlin was, but he was still, you know... A, a, I mean, he hated Jews, but he loved labor unions. So, <laughs> he, uh, well, I mean, I'm saying people like him and Woodrow Wilson, who, were, who sort of combined the ethics of the Bible with the ethics of progressive economics. And I think that's where it definitely comes from, is that sort of, it, it is sort of a nostalgia from when the left used to sort of co-opt religion in that way. I think that definitely at, the, at, at definitely at the turn of the 19th century, this became especially important to have labor laws. I don't think, though, that unions are particularly important today. The dynamics of business hegemony have, have become much more nuanced than they were in, say, the days of you know, coal mines in West Virginia. Um, I'd say as much as you don't have situations that outwardly extreme, you do have communities um, both regionally and along identity lines that are incredibly disenfranchised. You know, you have um, upwards of 20, it could be in the 30s, but I'll be conservative about it, say in the 20s, and uh, uh, upwards of 20% in employment in communities of color. Um, there are, you know, former industrial towns like Flint, Michigan, that have just been completely bottomed out, in large part from government action, so I'm not going to act as if, you know, that was the free market entirely screwing people over. Um, but I think when you have people in dire or straits like that, it is very easy for conglomerates like Walmart, you know, to enter a community and 
extract people's labor at to a degree that makes them more means and less individuals which with agency. So I think that so long as you make yourself useful and valuable to your employer, I think that unions are no longer necessary. And the union is the best way to mitigate the disparity between the worker and whomever you want to, however you want to classify the individuals at the top, you know, stockholders, uh, bosses, whatever word you want to use. Um, but I think once that disparity becomes too large, then you really run into just what is fundamentally an issue of human dignity. Well, thanks for listening, Catamounts. This has been Point Counterpoint. I'm Josh Gachette. And I'm Joey Brown.